Okay, good, af good afternoon. So it's my, it's my pleasure today to present Professor Natalie Mahowal, um, and she's gonna talk about the uh, three reports you see on the screen for the IPCC. Natalie has degrees in physics and German from University of, um, from Wash U, and a uh, degree in natural, uh, master's degree in, in um, natural resource policy from University of Michigan, and a PhD in meteorology from MIT. She worked at Santa Barbara after postdoc in Stockholm. She worked in Santa Barbara for a few years as, as a professor, moved on to NCAR, the National Center of Atmospheric Research, where she worked for a few years, and then she came here in 2007. She's been a lead author on the 1.5 degree report, which she'll talk about today, and also on the physical science of climate change for the fifth assessment of the IPCC. The focus of Natalie's work is on natural feedbacks in the climate system and how they responded in the past and may respond in the future to climate forcings. Much of her work is focused on mineral aerosols or dust as they are transported in the atmosphere. And this represents an excellent example for system processes as dust and associated minerals like iron are transported from the Sahara to the Amazon, for example. Her research is through a combination of three-dimensional models of, and analysis of, of climate and measured data. So let's welcome Natalie Mahol. Let's see if this microphone works. Great, it does. Well, thank you so much for coming today, despite the fact that it's gorgeous outside. I really appreciate that. So um, I'm in the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. And um, I had the honor of being selected as an author on the um, 1.5 report. So I'm going to talk about that. And you can see here kind of the, the formal IPCC uh, format for the 1.5 report. Um, but then I'm also going to talk to you a little bit about two other special reports that also came out in the last couple of years, one on climate change in land and one on the ocean and the cryosphere in a changing climate. Um, so I'm really trained as an atmospheric scientist. You could see that my PhD is in meteorology, but now really I work um, on questions where it's coupling the land, the ocean, and the atmosphere acts to integrate between them. I work with the big climate models, or the big earth system models, and here I'm going to talk about my work with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is, uh, I hope, interesting in a couple ways. Um, to me, I learned how science meets policy, and how they interface, and also uh, you know, got the big picture in terms of where the science is on trying to solve the problem of climate change. Um, I always want to advertise uh, this course is, of course, one of the required courses for our climate change minor. We have lots of great classes that professors across the entire university are teaching. So please check out our website and think about other classes you can take after this class. So the 1.5 report. Um, what that report was is a report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Now, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is run by the UN Environment Program and the World Meteorological Organization. Okay, so it's run on the international level, and its goal is to provide scientific advice for trying to stabilize climate by stabilizing greenhouse gases. This special report was um, called for, it, well, it's kind of unique in several different ways. Most of the time, the IPCC actually engages in kind of siloed work, where we work uh, in working group one, that's physical climate scientists like myself. Working group two is the impacts and vulnerability people. And working group three is all about mitigation, okay? And we don't really see each other very much. We don't talk to each other. The special report, this special report actually was the first report across those three working groups. So that was unique. A second way it was unique, it was actually specifically requested by um, the UN, by the IPCC country, it's, um, in, as part of, well, at the same time as the Paris Agreement. Hopefully you guys have heard something about the Paris Agreement, okay, right? In 2000, and I don't know why I always forget, 2014 or 15, um, the Paris Agreement had three really important pieces from my perspective. Most people would say two really important pieces. Okay, the first 
is that the countries agreed that they would try to keep temperatures below two degrees. The second thing is that they said that they would to undertake voluntary cuts in their own emissions, okay? Now, they admitted that those cuts would in absolutely no case ever get us to two degrees, okay? And the estimates are to actually get us to three degrees. But the third thing that happened at that meeting was that the small island developing states got up and said, we are tired of you climate scientists telling us that the lowest we can go is two degrees because we will suffer too much under two degrees. Could you guys please figure out how to keep it under 1.5, okay? Just see if it's possible to keep it under 1.5. So, so at the time that that was called, there's basically no scientific research suggesting that we can keep the temperatures below 1.5, okay? But the small island developing states, many of them won't exist under two degrees. Some actually won't exist under 1.5 either, right? They're really at risk countries here. But um, they wanted us to take a look at the 1.5 and see how to get there. So that's, that's the unique thing about this also, is that the 1.5 report was actually specifically called for by the countries. That's the only special report um, or any report that's ever been um, requested by the countries. Now, the other interesting thing is, first of all, you can see how long the request is. This is the title of the 1.5 report. You can see why we call it the 1.5 report. Okay, it's an IPCC special report on the impacts of global warming of 1.5 degrees C above pre-industrial levels and related global, uh, global greenhouse gas emission pathways in the context of strengthening the global response to the threat of climate change, sustainable development, and efforts to eradicate poverty. Now, this is really important. This is a really low goal, 1.5 degrees, juxtapositioned against sustainable development and eradication of poverty. Now, here in the United States, we often hear the climate change problem in the context, put in the context of business versus environment. But especially for these low targets, it, that's not completely accurate. It's not at all accurate for developing countries. The developing countries are the ones who are going to be emitting most of the CO2 in the future if we want under business as usual. That totally makes sense. There are maybe, you know, 7 billion people on the planet right now. 1 billion might be developed, 6 billion want to be developed. They want to live like us, okay? Why wouldn't they, right? We have it great here. Now, how we got to here is by emitting a lot of CO2. We did not develop sustainably, we developed though, okay? So the only pathway that has ever been shown to lead to the kind of uh, uh, wealth that we have here is by emitting a lot of CO2, okay? The developing countries want to have what we have. They want to have hospitals. They don't want their children dying of preventable diseases. They want to have energy. They want to have clean water, okay? And I would argue they have a right to that also. So they have a right to develop. But right there, it puts right at the, the crux of the issue, the fact that development and climate change are against each other or can be against each other. The whole point of this report is to try to look at the synergies how can we decouple development from emissions of carbon, make it cheap so everybody can afford it, and really both protect the climate as well as try to uh, eradicate poverty and have sustainable development. So that's a really tall order. And that's what we were trying to do in this 100-page report. So in some sense, we were trying to solve almost all the world's problems in 100-page report. Now, um, it, I, I'm gonna already tell you that it's really unlikely we're ever gonna stay below 1.5. But I wanna be a little bit positive and, and point out that actually on eradication of poverty and development, we're actually doing surprisingly well. Um, if we take a look here at, the, in, in green are the number of people not in extreme poverty, and red is the number of people living in extreme poverty from 1820 to present, you can see that actually over the last 30 years or 50 years, there's been a decrease in the absolute number of people living in extreme poverty. This is good news, okay? Now, unfortunately, again, the way we know how to bring people out of poverty is to emit a lot of CO2. So that's the unfortunate part. But the positive part is that the number of people living in extreme poverty and, and in poverty, the 
it is going down. It's not a solved problem at all, but it is going down, but it is taking CO2 emissions to do it. So the report that I'm going to talk about first is the 1.5 report. Again, that was jointly organized by the UN Environment Program and the World Meteorological Organization. And how these UN reports work is that the scientists write the report, summarizing all the available literature, and um, they, uh, the governments accept a certain part of it, the summary for policymakers, line by line, okay? And um, so it's really interesting. This is the first time that I went to a line by line approval session in the, of the summary for policymakers of the IPCC. So for me, this was a learning experience. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how it went. So uh, for our report, this is again a slide that they give us to send out. I mean, these IPCC reports are so much work by a huge number of people. There were 91 authors from 40 countries, 130 contributing authors, as well as 1,000 reviewers and 42,000 comments that we had to respond to. I mean, this is a, a, just an incredible amount of work. And so they want us to go out and talk to people about what is in the report because they're proud of it, and we worked really hard putting this together. Um, so we had to assess 6,000 new studies, many of which were not actually um, published when we started the report, right? As, as I said, there was basically no literature trying to keep the temperatures below 1.5 when we started this report, okay? And the policymakers said, you know, we don't, we don't care if you guys don't think it's possible. We want to know what we would have to do to make it possible. And so some of the studies are associated with, uh, with that, looking at this new, very low target. And some of the studies are just in general, more science becoming available. And other studies were looking at the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees, which is one of the tasks that we had. So the process for one IPCC reports is extremely formal, and there are many steps. The first thing is that the, the panel, which are the countries, actually approve the outline. So every item that is in the uh, summary for policymakers or the report has already been approved, basically, in the formal outline. And um, this becomes important, uh, especially when we talk about sustainable development, because some of the sustainable development goals include, for example, human rights. Okay. And some countries are not super excited about the words human rights occurring in the IPCC. So you'd be surprised which countries those are. For example, they include the US, um, but uh, the other totalitarian regimes it also includes. Um, so those words are X'd out whenever they find them, okay? Um, every once in a while we can sneak them through and they don't know. But, um, but basically the governments don't want us commenting on anything that's too political. They don't want the scientists' opinion. So nomination of authors at this point, this is where I was brought in. And uh, so uh, there were 91 authors selected. There were over 1,000 people nominated to the IPCC. So it was, it's pretty competitive to get on these, um, these boards. So then we write our, our first order draft. We try to address all the points that they want us to. It gets reviewed then um, both by scientific experts as well as government uh, officials for its science content but they can also say it's not in the outline. Please remove it. Um, we go through uh, several uh, reviews. We get a second order draft and then a final draft and then the summary for policymakers. And then the approval and the acceptance of the report is line by line in a, a huge room, basically. So it has to be approved by consensus and the governments are basically agreeing that the summary for policymakers represents the science accurately that's in the report, okay? So they're not saying they agree with the science politically, they're just saying it is an accurate reflection of the peer-reviewed scientific literature. So approval by consensus means that if we have one holdout government, then um, we have to go back and uh, try to uh, convince them that that is what the science indicates or uh, iterate a little bit on the language. So we were doing this um, almost a year and a half ago. It was supposed to take five days, Monday through Friday. It was supposed to be done at 7 p.m. on Friday. And the sessions, they kind of start out with a little bit banker's hours, I'd call it, like 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. and then 3 to 7, okay? Um, these are all simultaneously translated into the five different UN languages, so you could wear a little thing. If they weren't speaking English, I could, I could put one on to um, listen to what the government was saying, or they could listen to what we were saying in their own languages. Um, we, we already knew that most of these sessions do not finish on time. 
Um, some countries are not in favor of anything happening on climate change and they try to obscure progress. Let's just put it that way. Um, so we really hadn't made any progress uh, at all by Wednesday. So they added an evening session, 8 to 10.30. So they brought in a second crew of interpreters for that extra session, okay? So they had planned it in advance. On Thursday, we also added a night session from 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. And then there were also some 8 a.m. sessions going on. On Friday, we went all night straight through um, and to uh, Saturday at 3 p.m. We finally got approval. So how it, it looked during the session, um, it, it was in um, Inching in uh, Korea, close to Seoul. And uh, right up here on this screen, the, the sentence that we were working on would actually appear, okay? And then these are the co-chairs, um, Valerie and Jim are up here, and they're kind of running the session, they're the IPCC co-chairs. Here we are, this is myself, Morgan, um, Miles, Piers, and um, <laughs> Sonia. Um, and so we're the authors, and we're up there describing what it is that we want to say in this section. So we use English at first, and then we go through the formal language, um, trying to describe to the to the um, government scientists, you know, what we're trying to say, why we chose that language, and what we think is right. Then uh, the governments, you know, kind of raise their hand, and they say, I, I don't like that sentence, okay? Um, I object to that. So, for example, one country, every time uh, we presented, they, they wanted the order changed. So, if, you know, if it was 1.5 versus 2, and every once in a while we said 2 versus 1.5, they wanted them all consistent. So they would always stand up there. We just had a little variety, you know, just to keep people awake. And he wanted every single one the same. So we always had to, to go back and change. So that's an example of a, an English intervention. Sometimes there would be uh, questions about the scientific content. You know, there's this other paper. Are you sure that this is true? So um, those kind of interventions would also be included. So they would go into kind of informal huddles where we would go outside and talk to the, the authors, we'd go outside and talk to the governments and try to understand what their issue was. And then we also would have uh, what were called context groups, which were more formal, and there would be 40 people in a room trying to, to make progress. Um, the authors have the final say on what the text says, but the governments have the choice to approve or, or not to approve. So it's, it's a little bit of a negotiation process there. So here we are, there was actually a little Twitter, this is us on the first day, that's me. Um, we're sitting there trying to um, modify our text um, on the 1.5 report. And so this is a huddle. Um, and so uh, this is one of the vice chairs, but these are the government reps there. And they're saying, no, no, we don't like that you said blah, 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 blah. And we're sitting here trying to figure out exactly what they're saying. Because some of the time, it, it's not a science question, it's actually a language question. Um, and we, I, I, it's amazing how much time we uh, went through to try to resolve a problem that was um, it, our phrasing, they just didn't like our phrasing. Um, and it turned out there were kind of two problems. One was some of the developing countries want, it constantly emphasized that the reason that we're in the bind right now is because of the developed countries. The developed countries have caused one degree of warming. That only leaves us half a degree. So they wanted that repeated all the time, okay? And it took us a while to figure that out, but then we're like, oh, okay, all right, yeah, we can deal with that. And some of that was also um, because of the, the way that we propose things. So for example, we um, have a statement that made it through that says that past emissions alone will not let us, um, will not force us to go over 1.5. So we rephrased it and we said, if emissions go to zero tomorrow, we will not exceed 1.5 degrees. Those two statements are mathematically equivalent, but the diplomats could not deal with the hypothetical idea that emissions could go to zero, okay? And it took us forever to figure that out. So some of it is, uh, is also just a language issue, and they didn't understand that those were mathematically equivalent statements either, so. So then, this is 3 p.m. Saturday after uh, two all-nighters. Um, here we are, this is the lead author group says, uh, basically who wrote the summary for policymakers. I'm over here exhausted, um, but we were, we were really excited that we finally got it through. It was, there was a little bit of drama, um, and so uh, very excited. Um, some governments had actually indicated in the pre-planning for the COP that they didn't think that our report was gonna get approved, okay? So there were indications that some countries were, weren't super excited about it and we're gonna try to block it. <laughs> 
All right. So now we get back to what was in the report. So that was just kind of a, a taste of what it felt like to be on the trenches um, there and trying to get the science through. And I have to say, for the most part, we got all the science through we wanted. Okay, we had to deal with some wording. There were some parts that didn't get through that we, we weren't super excited, uh, super, we didn't think they would make it through, to be honest. We knew that the politics were, were not very good. All right, so um, where did we go? Oh, uh, I wanted to also mention there's two other reports, right? And I'm gonna talk about uh, the ocean report and the land report. There's also, these are our working groups where we're kind of siloed. This is our normal way of doing things. And so these are ongoing right now too. So there's a lot of IPCC reports. It's a, it's a huge burden on the climate change community to write these reports. So what did we come up with? What was approved? So uh, the first section, which I, I was uh, responsible for, was understanding 1.5. What does it mean to go to warming at 1.5? So the first thing is that since pre-industrial times, human activities are called one degree of warming. That wasn't actually controversial at all. We thought it might be. We are already seeing consequences for people, nature, and livelihoods. There's impacts today. And at the current rate, we're going to reach 1.5 degrees um, at about 2040. Okay, so um, that's 20 years from now. We're going to pass the goal that the countries gave us. But past emissions alone do not commit the world to 1.5. We, we could theoretically do it, okay, if we wanted to. So here's a, a diagram that demonstrates that. Here we are, 1960 all the way to 2100. And this is global temperature relative to pre-industrial, 1850 to 1900. So this, this um, gray in the back that are really variable, that's year-to-year uh, -year, um, temperatures. Actually, it might be monthly. That's a lot of, that's a lot of data points. So it's probably monthly. This orange yellow line is the um, anthropogenic portion of that. And you can see that we just extrapolate it and we get 2040. We're going to cross over 2040. Uh, we're going to cross over 1.5 in 2040. And so then all of a sudden we have to change the direction and try to stabilize at 1.5. That was what the um, UN countries asked us to do. So how in the world do we do that? So um, in the first part here, we're just going to think conceptually of what needs to happen. So right here is uh, CO2 emissions, and this is time. And you can see that CO2 emissions every year are going up, okay? We want to reach uh, 1.5 or any of the low climate targets. We have to immediately stop emitting, stop increasing the emission of CO2, and actually turn it around and go to zero. Because CO2 is, or about a third of the CO2 is in the atmosphere forever, 10,000 years. The CO2 has to go to net zero or the climate will continue to drift, okay? And um, so it, the maximum temperature rise is determined by the cumulative net CO2 emissions. If you have any CO2 emissions, the temperature is gonna continue to rise. And then there's a small contribution of the non-CO2 forcers. So over here, that's the non-CO2 forcers. So here's the cumulative CO2 emissions and how they contribute. and then on the same kind of radiative forcing scale, it's called, um, here's the non-CO2 forcer. So it's dominated even at very low temperatures, um, very low CO2 cumulative amounts. It's dominated by the CO2, okay? So what we have to do is totally turn around our CO2 emissions, stop them increasing and, and decrease them instead. Um, we don't actually have to do anything but keep the non-CO2 radiative forcing emissions constant because they don't accumulate in the atmosphere the way that CO2 does. So a lot of what we were supposed to do in this report is think about what the benefits of 1.5 versus two would be, because in, we had already assessed two degrees, okay? And the small island developing states really wanted us to look at what if it was 1.5 instead of two, okay? And so um, a lot of our impacts are just looking at 1.5 versus two, that's what we were asked to do. And basically when we started this report, there was almost no literature on such a small change. Normally, we climate scientists, we look at, you know, what's going to happen if we hit the system hard, if we, you know, do business as usual, not a really small change like a half a degree. And so there was a lot of new work done to see, can, can we see a half a degree? And the answer is yes. We can see statistically significantly 
a half a degree change in temperatures. You know, 1.5 versus 2, it may sound really similar, but it's going to have impacts. Uh, again, especially for people who live right at sea level. But you see less extreme weather where people live, including less extreme heat and rainfall. The global mean sea level rise is about 10 centimeters uh, lower. What's that? That's about 10 centimeters. So it's a few inches, okay? Now that may not sound like a lot to you, but if you're only a few feet above sea level and you need to survive during storm surge, for example, when there's a big storm, 10 centimeters really matters. I mean, um, if any of you were in New York City or know anything about what happened with Sandy, um, the superstorm Sandy, the um, storm surge is really what did all the damage, okay? Um, and so it's what happens when you have a big storm, when there's high tide and sea level rise. That's where you get the damage. So that would lead to about 10 million fewer, fewer people at risk of rising seas. There's um, lower impacts on just about everything. Um, different bio, uh, different species, different um, yields of different crops, and um, the global population that would suffer from increased water shortage is 50% less. So it's, it's quite a bit of a difference between those two. Lower risk to fisheries, and then um, especially people who are on the edge of poverty, you just have one bad event, somebody's cow dies, they can't buy a new cow, okay? They are all of a sudden then below the poverty line. They don't have a way to, to make money, okay? So that several hundred million fewer people would be at risk for the climate-related risk and susceptibility to poverty. So these just kind of bad events that could impact people right on the edge. So often in the reports, we talk about these reasons for concern diagrams here where this is temperature relative to um, pre-industrial levels, and these are different factors. So this is unique and threatened systems here. And white is okay, yellow is not okay, red is bad, purple is terrible, okay? Um, so unique and threatened systems, what are the most threatened systems by climate change? What do you think? Yep. Corals, especially, tropical corals, warm water corals. And what is the other, other end of the planet? What other ecosystems are really sensitive? The Arctic, okay? They're seeing a lot of change there. So that's what that means here. There's unique and especially threatened systems. And, you know, those are the ones that are at risk already just at two degrees here. Then you have extreme weather events, distribution of, of impacts in terms of who gets hit aggregate impacts, and then the chances for a large-scale singular event. Now, for the, our report, we only looked at 1 versus 1.5 versus 2. But, the, but this doesn't stop when you get to 2. So this is uh, the report from 2014, uh, um, the AR5, assessment report number 5, looking at the other scenarios, okay, that, that we were supposed to compare to. So over here, what we have is uh, this is global temperature. On this side, it's relative to current at that time. Over here, it's relative to pre-industrial on this side. So these are the temperatures, the observed temperatures. And then here, there's two scenarios. One is kind of a high business as usual. Here is if we don't do anything, this is where we're going to go. We're going to get about 5 degrees C by 2100. Or this is the 2 degree scenario. It has two-thirds chance of staying below 2 degrees. So this was the one that, that the two degree scenario that the small island developing states were saying, look, we, we gotta get lower than that. Tell us how to do it. Now, the important thing to realize um, between these two scenarios is there is a huge amount of work done right now in order to get off the business as usual and onto this um, two degree temperature scenario, okay? It's a complete restructuring of the economy to do this. And um, at the time, only one model, they're called integrated assessment model, could actually get to two degrees. Um, and use, they use kind of, perhaps you might say, unrealistic assumptions. Everybody's vegan. Corn ethanol uh, works. It, it doesn't actually work. Um, you, you put more fossil fuels into corn ethanol than you get out, the energy you get out. So it doesn't work. But they assumed it worked um, for this particular study. So there, there's a lot of assumptions that, that don't really work for this two-degree scenario. Um, 
and a lot of the models couldn't get it, but, but it's a huge expense right away. And you can see that you, you don't really see the difference in the climate right away. You're doing all this work right here, right now. And what we're doing it for is the people in 2100 or later, okay? And this, this is the problem, right? This is the intergenerational equity problem of climate change. Is, is it's gonna cost us a lot of money now to mitigate in order to help people in the future. Um, and you're not gonna see the impacts for 50 years. And it's super hard to motivate people to care about something like that. So um, here again is that reasons for concern slide. And I just want to point out that things just get worse. Okay, it's not like things stabilize at two degrees, like it might have looked like here, where we don't look uh, higher. The, that things just get worse. Um, and there's more and more potentially um, uh, bad impacts the higher the temperatures go. So um, one shouldn't really think about it as there's one tipping point. Sometimes people use this tipping point language. Um, that's not really the consensus view. There are millions of tipping points. Every ecosystem has its own tipping point. Every physical system has its own tipping point. And you're just gonna reach more and more of them the higher your temperature is. So it's just really important to try to keep temperatures as low as possible here. Um, and notice that under the Paris uh, voluntary agreements, there they would probably get to say three or 3.5. So if all the countries stayed in the Paris agreement, which the US has said it won't, then we might get to three or 3.5. So until the Paris Agreement, you know, until the US and China came up with that agreement, I pretty much was sure we were gonna hit five, okay? So, you know, it's pretty unlikely we're gonna hit 1.5, I'll say that. It's possible, but pretty unlikely. But I'm really glad that we're talking about three, honestly, because I've, I've been doing this for a long time and I've been thinking it's gonna hit 4.5 or five, okay? So to be a little bit positive, there is a small amount of progress here, and it's both with the Paris Agreement as well as wind and solar um, really coming online and, and being cheap. So how in the world could we keep it to 1.5? That's what we were asked to look at by the governments. To limit warming to 1.5, the CO2 emissions have to fall by 45% by 2030. So in the next 10 years, it was 12 years when we published, 12 years, 50% cut, in CO2 emissions while the developing countries continue to develop, okay? We don't wanna get in the way of that. Um, to limit warming to 1.5 degrees C, CO2 emissions would need to be net zero, I have to get to zero at about 2050. So really soon, we gotta turn it around. Now, reducing non-CO2 emissions like methane and aerosols, this really would have immediate health effects. And so we're always looking for ways that this extremely hard work of trying to prevent CO2 emissions can benefit people today. Because for the most part, we're doing it for the future, okay? But if you focus on things like the aerosols or uh, the methane, uh, in terms of their air quality benefits, you're, you're gonna see, uh, you're, you're gonna convince people more. I mean, what it really looked like, the reason that China was willing to enter that voluntary agreement with the US, if you remember, there was first a bilateral agreement between the US and China, Right before that, there had been a ton of studies talking about how many people were dying in China because of the bad air quality, because of coal. A lot of it was residential coal or industrial coal and the bad air quality. And not only were people dying, but it was impacting the economy hugely, okay? So it's not an accident, I don't think, that those studies all came out and got a lot of publicity and all of a sudden China wants to get rid of coal, okay? And they want to clean the air quality up. I think those things are related, and it's a really good way to get people um, who, especially developing countries, to think about how to get onto alternative energy sources instead of really dirty fossil fuel sources, is, is really arguing the air pollution. Um, so China um, seemed to really be making progress in that direction. Unfortunately, India hasn't really gone there yet. So that's another big country with terrible air quality. So limiting warming to 125 would require changes on an unprecedented scale, okay? You can think about like the cell phone revolution. You guys probably all have really nice cell phones and 10 years ago, okay, maybe you did then too. But there was like a five or 10 year period where everybody got a cell phone. That kind of revolution has to happen, uh, not just in one gadget, okay? But across every part of the economy, we have to all of a sudden discover ways to not emit CO2 and yet live 
at the high quality of life that we have here. So deep emission cuts in all sectors. We're going to have to use every technology, every policy available to us to cut this hard. Um, behavior changes are required. We, we can't do this, people might say, on the supply side. You can't just convert all the power from uh, coal or, or natural gas to solar and wind. That is insufficient. We also have to stop using energy. I mean, especially Americans, we're kind of energy pigs, okay? We have to cut our energy use. Um, really radical changes in behavior would be required. And we have to start investing in low carbon options. Progress in renewables would need to be mirrored in other sectors. We've got solar and wind for the power sector, but it turns out about 25%, maybe 50% of our CO2 emissions we don't have a substitute for. We, we gotta find a substitute, we gotta find it now, okay? That's what we need. We also are gonna have to start taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, just because we don't, there's some things we don't have substitutes for. For example, aviation, okay? You need liquid fuels to fly. Right now, we don't have a substitute. Cement produces a lot of CO2. Some uh, metal smelting also produces a lot of CO2 and we don't have substitutes for. So to offset those that we don't have substitutes for, we have to start taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Some of the ways, like the main way we would take it out would have huge implications for food security, ecosystems, and biodiversity. And that's where the land report comes in. So the national pledges, the voluntary agreements um, are, are not enough to keep warming down to 1.5 or 2. They, they might be consistent with 3 if everybody tightens them up, um, which there's no sign of that yet. Um, so here's some scenarios here. So remember, we have to, we have to cut um, uh, emissions dramatically. So this is our CO2 emissions. So I'm just going to go through two different scenarios here. So this one on the left actually stays under 1.5 without any overshoot, it's called. It, it never goes above 1.5. It stays below 1.5. And when we started the report, and actually the first couple of versions of the report, we didn't have such a scenario because no such scenario existed, okay? And we got a lot of negative reviews about that. They said, you are obliged to present a scenario that has no overshoot. So the guys who run the integrated assessment models, they went back and they did what they had to do to keep it under 1.5. And basically what they had to do is have, um, let me think, well, how did they do that? Uh, business, uh, a scenario in which social, business, and technological innovations result in lower energy demand. Okay, so that mild phrase there, what they did was they cut in half energy demand by everybody. Okay, what that would mean for us in this room is no driving, no flying, no eating meat, no buying things. Okay, that's basically what has to happen to keep under uh, 1.5 if there's no overshoot. Because we can't rely on just converting the power sector, it can't go fast enough. There's just too much. Uh, CO2 that we're emitting, and we can't convert everything over. So it has to be radical changes in behavior is the only way to do it. So let's just say that doesn't look like it's going to happen, okay? Over here on this side, they, there's a little more time to convert the economy over to lower CO2. But during that time, we emit a lot of CO2. And that CO2 has to be taken out of the atmosphere if we're going to come back under 1.5. So this, the gray here is the fossil fuels. The brown is a flu. Agriculture, forestry, and other land uses. Right now it's a source. It has to turn into a sink. And the yellow is what's called BEX, bioenergy carbon capture sequestration. And what it is is it's a type of carbon dioxide removal, and you're using plants for this. So bioenergy, you grow plants. They take CO2 out of the atmosphere, and they turn it into the plant. Okay, so they're fixing the organic matter. Then you take that organic matter and you burn it for your fuel. Okay, that's bioenergy. Then you capture all the CO2 that is coming out of that plant and you put it in the ground. Okay, that's carbon capture sequestration. That's what BEX is. And see how much BEX we have to be doing. We have to have 20, 30 gigatons a year of CO2 BEX. And we have to be laying it out at about 2030. We've got to be doing it large scale here. Now, just to understand what that infrastructure requirements are, 
Look, this is about the same, you know, it's 20, 30 gigatons here. And right now we emit about 20, 30 gigatons. So all the infrastructure we have right now for fossil fuels, we have to have that same infrastructure for bioenergy carbon capture sequestration. So it's just a huge amount of infrastructure, first of all. And secondly, it's a huge amount of land, okay? We'll come back to that. So a lot of what uh, the report ta is talking about is trying to make sure that we're attacking climate change while still uh, meeting the sustainable development goals or, or allowing countries to sustainably, development, to sustainably develop. And we're really looking for the synergies there. We're trying to make sure that we're doing everything possible to do things the, the easiest way, right? Especially if you're going for 1.5, you, you don't have room to do anything inefficient. You have to do things the best way. What has to happen is a whole mix of measures, right? Each individual country or community has to decide how, how to address CO2 um, emissions. And, and this has to be coordinated across different communities at all different levels. And international cooperation is a critical element of limiting warming to 1.5, okay? And, and this is actually the, the part where we got the most cuts in our text. They, the countries were not really interested and hearing about how we should all be nice to each other and share resources, okay? They, and that, that was the only way to reach 1.5. That's where um, most of our, our text got cut that got cut. So in summary, we're at one degree. It's not impossible to get under 1.5. It's possible. It, it just seems unlikely. We already are seeing harms. We need to adapt already. Um, it's really ambitious to reach either 1.5 or 2. We have to move to sustainable energy now. We have to change our behavior now. All of us have to stop using as much energy, stop using as much land. Um, and we need to develop carbon dioxide removal technologies that won't take up the land that BEX takes up, okay? That's the only way that we'll keep to any low climate targets. So this, for me, this has actually made it so here at Cornell, I'm teaching classes on carbon dioxide removal. I'm trying to organize more research on this. It's not what I do, but it's the only way to reach the low carbon target. So um, if you're interested in something new and cool, this, this is a burgeoning area that, you know, in the next 10 or 20 years, if we come up with something, we can hit the low carbon targets. Um, if we don't come up with something, you know, that it, we might not be able to. CO2 is a pretty inert compound. Trying to get it out of the atmosphere is pretty hard. The report is trying to identify uh, synergies, but it, it identifies potential trade-offs. So you have to make sure you're not forcing developing countries to use expensive technology. They don't have the money for it. So we here, especially here at Cornell, we have to develop super cool technologies, implement them, get them to work, figure out what didn't work, try it again. We have to do that here and then make those technologies available to developing countries so that they can decarbonize their development pathways. That's the only way. All right, so that's the 1.5 report. So I got a lot of publicity on that. I was actually live on TV on MSNBC, which is kind of an experience. And then I also uh, testified in, in front of Congress on the 1.5 report. So we got a lot of publicity last year about that. And, um, you know, one of the goals of the 1.5 report was to strengthen the global response to climate change. And, and then we, we might really have, have done something there. I felt like there were, that we got some traction at that point, that people were really starting to pay attention and starting to listen. And the Green New Deal and all these ideas started coming out after the 1.5 report. Um, it, I'm not sure it means that we're going to keep temperatures below 1.5. But on the other hand, it makes it more likely that we won't reach 5, which is great. Anything that keeps the temperatures low. So next I'm going to talk about uh, how am I doing? Okay, I'm going to talk about the land report. So this report was not one that I was integrated, uh, in, uh, so involved in as I was with the 1.5 report. Um, and again, you know, each of these reports is about 100 pages. It's got about uh, 90, 100 authors on it and a bunch of co uh, contributing authors. It's the same amount of work, each of these reports. Um, and so uh, if you're interested um, in, in more details, of course, you can Google for all these things and get more, more details about all the reports. But what's important to understand and what, was, what they wanted to address here is, uh, you know, read the title again. It's the, a special report on climate change, desertification, land degradation, sustainable land management, food security, 
and greenhouse gas fluxes in terrestrial ecosystem. Okay, so again, it's very broad. It's both ecosystem and biodiversity kind of ideas, as well as how people, I, I think the emphasis is more on people here. So what's really important to understand is that the land sees almost twice the global temperature that, um, in, in terms of temperature change. So here is a, a plot of, and I showed you before, 1850 to 2018, the temperature change. But if you look over land, it's always twice as much, okay? The oceans just don't change temperature very much, and 70% of the planet is the ocean, okay? So the land is where, is seen where, uh, seeing the temperature changes. And of course, that's where we live. And that's where terrestrial ecosystems are. So they get twice the impact right there. In addition, 23% of the anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture, forestry, and other land uses. Okay? So how we use the land really matters for driving climate change as well. I mean, it's mostly fossil fuels. It's mostly the power sector. We've got substitutes there. But land use is playing a role, and we, we don't really have substitutes. We, we only have one set of land here, okay? Uh, humans manage about 70% of ice-free land, okay? Some of it is urban infrastructure. Some of it is really heavily cropped systems, 12 to 14% heavily cropped. But then we've got pasture, our savanna lands and shrublands we're using, and, and um, pasture that we don't use quite so much. So that's already up to, what are we up to? 50% there. Then we include forest and plantation forest that we harvest regularly. We're up to 70%. So there's only 30% of the land surface that is actually in anything that one might call a natural state. So we're heavily managing the, the land system. So again, this kind of little the burning ember diagram or reasons for concern is used here. And so there's a lot of risks to the human and ecosystems from the changes in the land-based systems as a result of climate change. Dryland and water scarcity, of course, you know, even at two degrees, they're gonna be heavily impacted here in regions that are already semi-arid. Soil erosion is already a problem. Lots of agricultural regions don't, have uh, sufficient soil conservation efforts going on, including in the US, places that should know better, and climate change is only gonna aggravate that problem. So vegetation loss, wildfire damage, permafrost degradation in the high latitudes, tropical crop yield decline, it's already getting hotter in the tropics, and food supply instabilities. Um, these impacts are not independent of human socioeconomic decisions, let's just say. So this is kind of a technical slide talking about shared socioeconomic pathways or SSPs, okay? Very technical name, I don't want you to get that. I just want you to think about though, the different ways that we could develop the worldwide kind of from now. We could um, uh, get very nationalistic and very militaristic and not help anybody. Okay, that's one development pathway. So the U.S. never gives any money to any developing countries. No sharing goes on. And uh, there might not be very much economic development in a lot of the developing countries. Another scenario is everybody's super nice to each other and we give tons of resources to developing countries. They all become democratic. There's no political corruption. They all develop wonderfully really quickly. Okay. And then there's in-between scenarios. And those are called the socioeconomic pathways. And how much there is an impact on the land surface really depends on these. So these SSPs, those are those different ways things happen. So desertification could be really mild under all sorts of really high temperatures, or it could be terrible. It just depends on what kind of socioeconomic pathway we take and how careful we are with our, for example, our dry lands. Again, land degradation, um, if we're careful, there's not gonna to be too much land degradation. If we're not careful, we take a pathway that doesn't allow us to share information and manage the lands well. Food security again, okay? So the choices we make, political, socioeconomic choices we make, and you know, it's not like we get together and vote about what other countries do, but the, the evolution of that is really gonna matter for the climate impact. And that's what this um, slide is, is meant to show. <clears throat> 
There's also a lot of trade-offs here. And um, you, you can see these are kind of busy slides that IPCC scientists like to put together. So the, the blue areas mean that they're large positives, and the red uh, areas means there's large negatives. So I'm just going to highlight this large negative here. And that's between food security and reduced cropland, grassland conversion to cropland. Okay. Right there, right? There's a, a big problem. If you want biodiversity in, in grasslands, for example, that you want to keep some of the species alive there, then you can't convert the land to more agriculture, which could impact your food security. There are trade-offs. We only have a finite amount of land. And that's where, for example, again, here's another brown one, the restoration and reduced conversion of peatlands versus food security, okay? That's going to impact some people. Those are trade-offs. And so that's what this is trying to identify, is where there's synergies and where there's trade-offs. So for example, you can have the mitigation of CO2 emissions here using agroforestry. So those go together, and that's a synergy. So you can both get um, good agricultural crops as well as reduce your CO2 emissions if you use some land management techniques. So that's what this is trying to identify. So one of the kind of interesting, I'd say, conflicts or differences is that in the 1.5 report, we said, you, you know, to do BECS, to get to 1.5, you have to do BECS, basically, and you need a lot of land. So here's a quote here. You need about, uh, let's see, uh, 4 million kilometers squared, 2 million, 11 million kilometers squared, a changeover um, into biofuels. Um, in different scenarios. There's kind of ranges, okay? Millions of kilometers, multiple millions of kilometers squared uh, of land. It's a huge amount of land you need to do this. Maybe, you know, half of the land right now in the Midwest that's being used for food crops would be needed, okay, for the U.S. to offset its own CO2 emissions. What does the land say about that? Um, the land says, this is the quote from the land, widespread use at scale of several millions of kilometers squared globally could increase risk for desertification, land degradation, food security, and sustainable development. Okay, basically the land report says, don't do that, okay? <laughs> but that's the only way to reach 1.5, okay? And so uh, here's a comment from one of the authors. There is a role for Bex, surely, but not at the scale the models are showing. Okay, so we... Um, People would argue that it's actually a bad idea from a land perspective to do as much BEX as we would have to do to keep it under 1.5 degrees. Okay, so this is one of the interactions between the two reports. Um, there's also, here's another one of these kind of crazy plots where they're showing tons of things, but here's a bioenergy and BEX column here. This is mitigation, adaptation, desertification, land degradation. So mitigation is good for, adaptation, eh, maybe. Desertification, not so much. Land degradation. Food security, it's a problem. Okay. So um, back in 2007, 2008, there was an increase in the desire for bioenergy, and it drove up the prices for food. And there was actually a global food crisis. So here I have a, a quote are, um, I, saying this again, that um, if you try to convert too much land over to bioenergy, you'll either heavily impact biodiversity, and or you will impact food security concerns because it just needs so much land. All right, so a summary of the land report. Remember how much land humans use. I mean, there's just, uh, we're, we're already going to have biodiversity problems because there's no land that's natural, almost no land that's natural. Um, bioenergy, food, and biodiversity all compete for the same land. Agriculture, forestry, and other land uses contribute to climate change, and the land feels twice as much climate change as on average, the global average. All right, so let me get to the ocean here real quick. What time am I supposed to end? Five more minutes, okay, I'm sorry. Here, let me go quick. Why do we combine the ocean and the cryosphere together? Why are they in one report? Why? What is it? Land ice melts and what does it turn into? Water, okay? Sea level rise, okay? That's why they're in the same report. All right, so we know the temperatures could rise a lot. Here's, you know, this uh, business as usual we saw before versus the two degree scenario. 
This is our temperatures out to 2100. What this means is there's a lot of energy going into the oceans. Now, water does not expand very much when you heat it up, okay? But it expands a little tiny bit when you heat it up. And there's a lot of water in the oceans, okay? So when you have five kilometers of water in the ocean and all that water just expands a little bit, you can get a bit of sea level rise just from that, okay? So the thermal expansion in the oceans right now is probably the dominant source of the sea level rise. Um, but in the future, we have other things going on. Um, we also have the ocean acidification problem where the pH in the oceans is going down because CO2, when it gets into the ocean, is slightly acidic. So it's reducing the ocean uh, um, uh, pH. So it's increasing the acidity. So uh, in addition, Greenland is losing mass right now, and we think it's going to keep losing mass, especially if we go on the... 8.5 report. Antarctic ice sheet is going to lose mass and the glacier mass loss. Okay, so land ice, when it melts, what does the ice do? Runs into the ocean. Okay, that additional water is going to cause, you know, almost a meter of sea level rise at 2100 if we go with business as usual, but it's going to keep the, the cryosphere and the ocean react really slowly. They take a long time. So even if we manage to stabilize temperatures at this time, sea level, the, the glaciers, Greenland and Antarctica are going to continue to melt. And so we're going to get, say, four meters then by 2300. It's just going to take a while for all that stuff to melt, but it's, it's a lot of water. Okay. When sea ice melts, does sea level rise? No, because the water is already in the water. Okay doesn't matter if it's floating on top or not. Sea, sea ice doesn't do um, anything to sea level rise. It does other things. It changes the albedo and, uh, of course, polar bears, the classic polar bear problem. Um, again, one of these really busy slides here, but um, I just want to point out if you want, you know, your corals, if you like your corals, you like to go snorkeling. Um, they're heavily impacted in the North Atlantic, South Pacific, Tropical Atlantic, Tropical Indian. Tropical Pacific, everywhere, okay? Ocean acidification and warming oceans are gonna kill off the corals. High mountain and polar regions are also heavily impacted as well. So the mountain glaciers are impacted. Um, it's gonna cause shifts in um, net primary production in the oceans and actually probably a decrease in, overall in the oceans, okay? So just to understand very simply, the oceans are heated from above and they have a very slow turnover time because they're heated from above, whereas the, ocean, the atmosphere is heated from below, okay? The surface is where it's heated from. So the oceans are heated from above, so it takes about 500 years to really ventilate the whole ocean. And when you heat it even more from above, it gets even harder to ventilate it. And that means less nutrients coming to the surface and less productivity, okay? Less recycling in the oceans. So it's gonna cause, uh, fisheries impacts as well. All right, I think I'm gonna have to, I might be going over here. Um, sea level rise really causes a lot of risk to anybody living on the coast, okay? And uh, the thing is, is remember it's not, you know, it's not just that it rises up all the time, it's that during storms, then you have that higher base, and that's what's going to get you. So you're going to get it during the storms, when you have the storm surge, high tide, those kind of events. So that's when you're going to feel the impact of this small amount of sea level or this huge amount of sea level, depending on what time period we're talking about. All right. So the oceans report. The high altitude regions, we didn't talk about this too much, are heavily impacted, and they're going to impact the downstream communities. The thing to think about is that snow and ice on those mountains, you can think in uh, the Tibetan Plateau and Himalaya, that snow, the precipitation in the winter is kind of held there until the growing season comes, okay? And then in the growing season, you get the water running off. We see this in the Sierra Nevadas and California as well. If you don't have, if it's not snowing anymore, it's raining, uh, you don't have that huge uh, reservoir. You have to build a reservoir. It's, it's a huge amount of resources then. To, to deal with. Sea level rise is a major problem. Now we have about um, 15 centimeters. It's gonna be one meter almost at, at 2100 and, and then more, we expect more 
And the ocean ecosystems are heavily affected, both because of ocean acidification, which makes it hard for uh, calcifying organisms to form, as well as warmer oceans um, bleach out the corals, for example. And then there's a shift in, in the, the ecosystems because of the warmer water. All right, thank you. Behind the microphone on both sides, just cross over or cross and back. Uh, hey, how's it going? Um, quick question. So what initially inspired you to start this kind of work? Well, that's a good question. Um, so uh, when I entered meteorology, long, long ago. I was actually more interested in, in air pollution. Um, global warming wasn't really on my radar screen, but uh, if you work in atmospheric sciences and there's this steady trend, you, you just end up working on climate issues. Um, and so um, a lot of what I work on is say aerosol climate and biogeochemistry interactions, um, just because I find it fascinating and trying to understand the natural feedbacks. So, um, that that's really how I got into it. Um, hi, I have a question about your first report. So in the first report, you said that we need both behavioral change and like systemic political change. I feel like um, a lot of climate, uh, like the root cause of climate change is because of like the system, like capitalistic system. So we tend to neglect in all uh, like social behavior change. So how do you like emphasize like individual change? Because we need both. Right, I mean, we need change at every level. We need individuals to make the right decisions. All of us, <laughs> right, to make the right decisions. So um, we have to stop driving, buying houses out in the countryside, you know, buying, buying objects, right? Those are individual decisions and what we eat, but you know, by ourselves, it, it doesn't matter. We, we have to organize and make it so that this behavior change isn't just one or two people, it's everyone. Then in addition, um, so, so re really what you need then is incentives to do this. So one would be, for example, carbon tax could make people um, make choices that we want them to make. Um, and so there are political tools and policy tools that would help people make better choices. Um, another thing is, is just to, um, for example, let you know, you know, what, what is the carbon footprint of my new computer? Okay, what, what, when I did that, how much was that? So like a calorie count on all our objects, what's the carbon footprint of my flying, right? Just some of it is also information to, so we make better decisions. Um, but, uh, it, you know, it can't just be individual, but it can't just be corporations taking these actions or government, you know, it really has to be across all levels to, to make progress on this. Um, and you know, we are, we're the ones with a huge carbon footprint, so we should be leading this effort. But somehow we gotta make it so that people who are in developing countries can also use uh, low carbon approaches uh, to get to um, a, a better quality of life. So that, that's a real dilemma. We have to figure out how to do that. Uh, you mentioned that um, in order to meet 1.5 degrees Celsius or other goals, we need to implement a lot of carbon capture strategies. What do you think about reforestation as a carbon capture strategy? Oh, that, that's in there. Okay, so the, um, uh, we, we should do that. We have done that. But if you see that you can't do everything, so a trillion trees does not solve our problem. Um, okay, right here, the, the brown here. That's reforestation, afforestation, and soil, right? And, and it can only get about three gigatons of carbon per year, unfortunately. There, there are some estimates that are higher, but most people don't believe them. Unfortunately, we can't do enough with just working with nature, native, natural ecosystems. We're gonna have to do some kind of manipulations. Yeah. Hi, um, thank you for coming to speak with us today. I was just curious, um, since you wrote all these reports for the governments about the difference between like 1.5 and two degrees increase, 
I was wondering what you think is the, um, the benefit of knowing the discrepancy between those two and the results instead of just broadly saying we need to make change and we need to reduce and instead making those goals. Do you think that the visualization perhaps helps in making those impacts that we need? So, uh, I mean, to be honest, when I was in first invited to be on this report, I was kind of like, why are we bothering? Okay, because we're not going to meet two anyway. So why are we bothering? Um, but it, it, you learn so much on these reports. So I, I ended up wanting to do it. Um, I, I think that uh, the politicians basically who called for the 1.5 report really understood that, uh, that um, you know, the impacts that are that we identify are going to happen really soon. And, and people, un unfortunately, are just very um, selfish and, and have short time scales. So the fact that we have to do this within the next 12 years, right, that, made it, that got a lot of publicity. Now it's 10 years. We have 10 years to turn around the whole economy, OK? Or in 20 years, we're, we're going to cross 1.5, and we're going to see you know, bad impacts. So having it be a short temporal scale made it feel more urgent to people and might have gotten more action. So I think that's where the politicians were absolutely right. Strengthening the global response was, I think, one of the main points of the report. Hi. So you talked a lot about how land use was a huge consequence of carbon removal. So I was wondering if algae and algae biofuels were considered. Yeah, so um, uh, that is one of the, the bioenergies. Right now, there isn't a way to do that large scale. So the reason the models choose the BEX is because it's the only existing technology, and we basically have to be doing it at large scale in 10 years. So like, you have to take what you have. But um, th there could be bio, uh, algae biofuels could be um, one of the other ways that we should pursue. I, um, I personally think all the different ways that we might be able to do carbon dioxide removal, we should be looking at right now very heavily if we want to avoid some of these, these um, high uh, climate impacts. Anyone on that side have a question? Move the microphone. Here's your hand if you want me to Sorry, I can't. Okay, you can hear me. Sorry. My question was is that have you guys gone over more specific um, ways basically to get to this? Because it's great to just talk about it. Um, and last class, last week we talked to the mayor about is it if it goes to the review. And stuff. It's awesome that people are talking about it and making trying to do their policy, but no one's talking about like specific. Point that we should be doing. Yeah, so uh, for our report, we only did it globally. We didn't look regionally, and this would all have to be done at the local scale. So really what we put together was a menu of options that we encourage uh, uh, different communities, different states, different you know, federal governments, different international groups to look at, okay? Um, I, th I think what you're saying is, is absolutely right on. I mean, we need a plan for the U.S. to implement these things. And, and there are a few studies looking at those options, but we need more than a plan. We need to actually start doing some of these things. Some of it is happening at the state level. I mean, here in New York State, they're making efforts, but we are a little bit stymied because the federal government is, is not doing very much here in this country. What do most, what do most politicians agree on doing? Maybe like my question should be, what do most politicians see that is feasible to do? Right, very modest reductions, to be honest. Um, uh, th those were the voluntary agreements were, you know, so the U.S. voluntarily agreed to reduce um, emissions, I think it's 20 or 30 percent. So basically, they could have reached that target just from switching from coal to cheaper natural gas, okay? They, that, it wasn't very ambitious. Some of the other countries were a little more ambitious. And um, I mean, especially countries that don't have their own fossil fuels, for energy security, they're making much more progress. So some of the European countries are very aggressively going after renewables. But on the other hand, for example, Germany is going to move from nuclear power to coal-fired power plants um, as a backup, unfortunately. So um, uh, Japan is doing the same. So 
two steps forward, one step back. You know, it's it's a hard problem. Any more questions? Does someone want to shout one out? You said the developing countries that they need to reduce their emission of CO2, but how do you have any ideas in which they can do that while also developing further developing? Like how in order for us to develop we emitted CO2, how do you suggest they do it without emitting that CO2? So that's the crux of the problem, right? Okay, so the uh, the question was um, that uh, I pointed out that developing countries are the ones that if there's no mitigation will emit most of the future CO2, okay, just because there's more people in developing countries than developed countries. So how in the world can they not emit that CO2? What, what can we do? So the report lays out a menu uh, of options, but it's really, um, you know, we, we do have solar and wind that are, that are quite cheap. The problem is the intermittency, okay? And so, you know, if you're a developing country, you have no power for this hospital you want to put in. Um, you either have to put in two power plants, one coal fired and solar that you, you only you use the solar during the day. Okay. But you have to turn on the coal fired power plant at night, which you can't turn on coal fired power plants and off every day. You just can't do that. Okay. So they're kind of in a bind that even if it's cheaper to do solar because of the intermittency issue, they're going to go with fossil fuels some of the time. So it's a really hard problem. Um, and people are trying to make progress, but there, there are barriers like that, that, you know, the batteries are just not there in terms of cheapness and technology. Okay, um, to quit, and enjoy the afternoon. I'm going to thank Natalie again.